Hello Botany, Mr. Miller here with another plant presentation. While last time we talked about plants more broadly, today we are going to get more specific than just where plants fit among the other domains and kingdoms of life. Today we're going to focus specifically on plant structure and reproduction. All right, so let's get started. So I do want to mention before we begin that there is a companion note guide a skeleton fill-in-the-blank note guide that has been provided um, not only to students in class who have gotten this presentation in class but to you virtual folks at home as well so feel free to follow along and go ahead and fill in those blanks all right or if you'd like to write your own notes that is great as well we're going to see this diagram come back later on okay so let's talk about vegetative structures Vegetative structures are going to be structures um, that give rise to new plants. They're structures that can aid in propagation. So whenever we think of the word vegetation, we are going to kind of what comes to mind is usually leaves, usually what we can see the distinguishable part of plants. However, um, vegetative structures can relate to all three parts of our primary plant body, which are number one, roots, which take in the nutrients, number two, stems, which help conduct water and nutrients up to the leaves and help conduct sugar and nutrients down to the roots, and then three, which are the leaves. All right, so specialized structures that can be used to make more plants, which is what propagation means we learned in our last lecture. All right, so among these specialized structures, there are some of which that are used as underground storage units for nutrients, particularly sugars uh, like starch. So bulbs, to start with, are a modified stem structure seen in onions, as an example. Um, they help to store nutrients, and when perhaps the plant needs nutrients up in its uh, further up its stem or its leaves, they can be shuttled, shuttled there at that time. Corms are also a modified stem found in the gladiolus flower um, and other what they call cormic flowers, flowers that contain corms. Um, and they are also another modified stem storage structure. And then uh, lastly, tubers are, are an underground storage unit found in potatoes and carrots. Um, and they are a true root structure. So while corms and bulbs are stem-like structures, um, tubers are root structures, all of which though are used to store nutrients. All right, then we have runners and rhizomes. So these are horizontal uh, plant stems. They're outgrowths, an outgrowth in the main stem, and it allows the plant to spread rapidly in the horizontal direction. For example, strawberries can propagate this way vegetatively from one plant giving rise to other adjacent plants. Um, they call them runners because they run. Usually runners run above the soil and rhizomes kind of uh, dig a little bit below the soil. So they're just below the soil, rhizomes. But rhizomes also allow the plant to spread horizontally and give rise to new units. So rhizomes... Um, would be essentially modified horizontal stems as well as runners that allow new plants like this one on the right to, to grow quite far from the original plant. So these modified stems allow that. Now let's talk about reproductive structures. We've got a wave petunia down here on the right and we've got multiple different fruits and their seeds. So let's talk about it. So angiosperms, which we're going to spend most of our semester um, talking about, are flowering plants. They are the ones that evolved the most recently, about 140 million years ago. I know, still rather um, in the distant past. However, they are the newest um, group of plants. And in them, the flower, hence the name flowering plants, is the reproductive organ. So the basic function of a flower is to produce seeds through what we call sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is a fusion of gametes 
which are sex cells, think of like a sperm and an egg in a human being, and that allows for greater genetic diversity and greater chance of survival in the offspring. So the flower or the fruit for that matter, so a fruit um, essentially can be a flower, um, is an example of a flower. Um, so flowers produce seeds through sexual reproduction. Seeds are the next generation, and they are the way that new plants offspring spread across a landscape. So they can be dispersed via fruits, um, as well as by wind, other ways. We talked briefly about dispersal in the last presentation. Um, and that dispersal is typically the function of a fruit, and that is the structural part that would surround the seed in angiosperms. So it is the seed storage, um, the seed storage structure of the flower or reproductive organ is what the fruit is. Sexual reproduction. All right. So this is where it starts to get a little more complex in terms of structures. But essentially what it is, is the fusion of male and female sex cells. So I think sperm and egg on these are called gametes. And they allow the creation of a new and genetically diverse offspring um, in an event called fertilization. So you'll have your, your egg and your sperm, which in animals would fuse to form a zygote. Um, and you might remember terms like diploid, haploid. We're not going to worry about that right now. Um, but essentially, these two cells um, come together to form a zygote in an event called fertilization. So in flowering plants, if we talk about the structures seen here on the right, the stamen is going to be the male reproductive structure composed of our anther, which is essentially the, the head of the area that will uh, receive the pollen, and then our filament, which is the long kind of tube-like structure that is attached to it. So we have our male reproductive structure being the stamen. And the pistil is the female reproductive structure. And we have kind of three subdivided structures within that, our stigma, our style, and our ovary, all right? So essentially, um, the anther, being the male uh, reproductive structure, um, produces the pollen excuse me, I think I said it receives the pollen before it produces the pollen. Um, and then say a honeybee or any kind of a pollinator would go ahead, um, receive the pollen from the anther and take it to the stigma, which is the opening of the female uh, reproductive structure called the pistil. Um, and then that pollen would go ahead and descend all the way from the stigma or the opening down the long tube-like style into the ovary where fertilization can happen. So remember, stamen, male reproductive structure, pistil, which has the ovary style and stigma, female reproductive structures. So pollen from our anther, this is kind of where we talk about the process, enters the stigma, travels down the long tube-like style, and into the ovary where fertilization occurs. All right, so that is sexual reproduction. That was how we get a genetically diverse offspring. However, plants can reproduce via asexual reproduction. As we've seen in lab with our propagation of mother-in-law's tongue, we literally took a cutting from one plant and uh, plopped other sections of it in the soil so essentially, we're just cloning that plant that is asexual reproduction, no genetic diversity. The offspring are exactly the same as their parent. So no fusion of gametes, but rather the parent plant produces an exact clone of itself. Examples of this could be budding from the left. So we have a plant right here, which will give rise to uh, different new baby plants budding off of it. Um, this would be the example with our Echevaria uh, plants that we have in the greenhouse. 
um, essentially they have this kind of basal rosette. They're kind of a symmetrical uh, flower and you can see smaller plants uh, rising from kind of the base of that, of that original parent plant. Fragmentation or cutting is another way. So typically uh, budding occurs kind of naturally, like um, it will occur in nature without, you know, interference from uh, humans or, or kind of artificial methods. Whereas uh, fragmentation happens more often via human beings like doing cuttings. Um, but I suppose it could happen if say, um, maybe something sliced off the edge of a leaf and it fell on the ground and it could give rise to new plants on the ground. And then spores as well, which are another reproductive, uh, an asexual reproductive structure that gives rise to something called a gametophyte. Um, but sporophyte, gametophyte, we're going to save all that fun terminology for later. So just know that spores are another, another method of asexual reproduction. Now, vegetative reproduction is going to be a type of asexual reproduction. Let me uh, close that out. Oh, that's not what I want. All right. So for example, using plant cuttings to reproduce plants from ex existing plants is an example of uh, vegetative reproduction or vegetative propagation. Um, so what this is, is where a new plant grows from a fragment of the parent plant or a specialized vegetative structure. So like corms or bulbs or rhizomes, runners, um, so on and so forth. Uh, many plants do this naturally, but we as botanists can do it artificially to clone specimen as we have done with our mother-in-law's tongue plant. And as I will show you with whatever plant um, our, hybrid, our hybrid students select to be our next uh, specimen in the greenhouse. All right, so it's that time of the show um, for name that structure. All right, so I want you to go ahead and take a moment, and on that note sheet, there's going to be a diagram, a place that you can go ahead and name that structure. So go ahead and do so. Okay, I'm going to exit this preview view, and I can actually go ahead and type the correct structure in there. There is your word bank right there, however. All right, let's find where we are. It's a great meme. I wish every day was Friday. All right, so got a text box here. So remember that on the right, this kind of elongated, very thin structure that does not contain the ovary is going to be our male reproductive structure. So the overarching structure, there's, remember there's two parts to each. The overarching structure is the stamen or stamen I've heard pronounced. Um, whereas the end, kind of the head of it is going to be the anther where kind of the, the point at which the pollen is grabbed by a pollinator or is released from our stamen. Um, and the long kind of fibrous filament is ap aptly named the filament. So that is the filament. I don't expect you to know any of these non-covered uh, structures here like the sepal uh, or the petal, though you probably already know flower petals. Um, all right, on the other end, the female structure, the overall name um, is going to be the pistil, different than, you know, the one that you can put ammunition in. It's a different, uh, different spelling, uh, the pistil. And then we have three parts of that pistil. We have our stigma, which is going to be the end of it. Think about ending stigmas. You could, you could try to use that as like a, a way to remember. We want to end stigmas as a society, and the stigma is found at the end of the pistol. All right. Um, then the long tube-like structure that connects the stigma to whatever's down here is the style. 
I don't really have a good way of remembering that one, but essentially the ovary you can think of as being the place where the female um, reproductive structures are housed. The female eggs uh, would be housed in say, um, in say a mammal. Um, so we can think about it as being, as the pollen leaving the anther, so the pollen leaving the stamen from the end of the stamen, which is the anther, going to the end of our pistil, which is our stigma, proceeding down the style and into the ovary where fertilization occurs. Okay, everybody, that will conclude our presentation for today. Uh, watch for assignments. I'll be posting this plant pen pals assignment as well. And the homework for this weekend is to go ahead and watch this video. It is uh, available on Edpuzzle, but if you're having trouble, I posted the YouTube video in Classroom. And then the other uh, component of homework will be reading section 1.1, uh, the first section of the world of plants, about 10 pages, um, and complete that worksheet. Now, if you would like to have that, have that read to you, uh, remember there is the option to listen to an audio version. So that is right here. All right, just reference the botany calendar. Um, this presentation will also be up here um, as something I want you to watch for Monday. Um, and go ahead and have a fantastic weekend, everybody. All right, thanks. Bye.